Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Today we're going to be in conversation about autism. And my guest for this conversation is Dr. Devin Price. Devin Price is a social psychologist, professor, author, and proud person with autism. Devin Price is also the author of the book that we are going to be in conversation about. It's called Unmasking Autism, Discovering the New Faces of Neurodiversity. Dr. Price, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this radio program. Hi, Mitch. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you. Um, I want to ask you about a term as we begin here, masked autism. What is meant by... Now, the, the name of your book is Unmasking. Talk to me about masked autism. What is it? What do you mean by that? Yeah. So, um, you know, a few years ago, there was a lot of talk kind of in the public conversation about how the autism diagnosis rate was going up in children. And of course, that's where we got a lot of the kind of hand wringing concern about vaccines causing autism and that kind of fear mongering. Um, what we're seeing now in the literature and just demographically is that a lot of people are finding out that they're autistic later in life um, for the same reason that the autism diagnosis rate was going up in children. We're learning more about what autism really is and how it looks in a wide variety of people. And so there are a lot of people that are finding out they're autistic that they never knew that they were before and no one flagged them as potentially autistic because they didn't fit the really narrow stereotype of the disability that many of us have. And that certainly I had before I found out I was autistic. The like little white boy who's obsessed with trains or very like, or sports statistics kind of stereotype. Of autism. So when I say masked autis autism, I'm talking about um, autism in trans people and queer people, gender nonconforming people, autism in people of color and women, basically anybody who doesn't present or isn't viewed in that very stereotypical uh, view of autism. And because most of us in that category, that really diverse category, never found out we had a disability until later in life, we've had to basically mask as a neurotypical person. So faking eye contact, even when it's really painful to do so, memorizing social scripts and imitating them so we blend in, not telling people when we're in a state of really severe sensory overload, everything that we do basically to camouflage that we have a disability, that's what masking autism is. You didn't figure out that you were autistic until after you were a psychologist. Yeah, absolutely. So I had, you know, a PhD in psychology under my belt um, from Loyola here in Chicago. And all I knew in my late 20s, having finished that um, about autism was just the most narrow stereotypes of how it looks in some children, not even all autistic children, but how it looks in kind of the most stereotypical cases. And what really unlocked a much broader understanding of autism for me is when a cousin of mine kind of took me aside at a family gathering. He had just gone away to college and was having a ton of difficulty adjusting and he had gotten diagnosed. And he was asking me because he assumed because I had psychological training on this advanced level that I would know about it. And I knew nothing about um, what autism really was neurologically and socially. And he kind of was breaking down for me just, oh, have you noticed how many people in our family have these very autistic kind of traits once you know to look for it. And that's what kind of set me on the path of, of looking into it for myself and just really reading the literature and kind of re-educating myself about what autism actually is and getting to know actually autistic people. How, how do you define autism when you explain it to people? What, what, what is it? I mean, we all have a sense of it, but what, what is it? Yeah. Yeah, so autism covers so many aspects of a person's being. It's a pervasive developmental disability. And what I found the best way to sum up the many different aspects that define autism is basically this, that we process the world in a very bottom-up fashion. And there's a lot of neurological research to back this up. Whereas non-autistic people, sometimes called holistic people, tend to move through the world processing things in a very top-down fashion. So an example of this, um, if you're a non-autistic person, you usually can kind of intuitively understand when you walk into a new environment, let's say a party that you've never been to before or a restaurant you've never been to before, you know which information to kind of drown out, what background noise to not pay attention to, conversations have, happening in the corner that don't really involve you. 
you know where to stand, you know how to order if it's at a restaurant, um, you kind of get a very good intuitive social sense of how to comport yourself in that environment. Um, and you might even ignore tiny bits of data that don't go along with that big picture gut reaction that you have about what the environment is and how it works. Whereas for autistic people, we're basically having to piece together all of this social and sensory data from the ground up. So we don't filter out noise and visual details the way neurotypical brains do. So we're really kind of bombarded with information, all kind of vying equally for our attention. And we tend to not take anything for granted socially. So if I've never been to a particular type of restaurant before, what the social norms are for how loud you're supposed to speak and how you're supposed to order or how you're supposed to dress and what time you're supposed to show up for a certain kind of party, it doesn't make intuitive sense to most of us. We have to kind of pick up on all the tiny, small, nonverbal cues and like little detectives basically piece it together and draw a conclusion. And it's because autistic people process the world in such a multi-layered bottom-up way that we get some of the biggest struggles associated with autism. So not being as intuitive at reading social cues, not always having as much confidence in understanding other people's emotions, um, being really overloaded by sensory information, needing a lot of recharge time after socializing or being in a new place. We just are processing everything on a much more effortful piece by piece level than um, holistics do. We oftentimes hear the term, the spectrum when it, when it comes to autism, is, is this a real thing? And, and sometimes it's, if you're on a particular area of the spectrum, you may be quote unquote, and I want to be careful language here and you'll give me your reaction to it. But some people may be quote unquote, more functional. What, what, what is your sense of when we talk about an autism spectrum? Yeah, so I think when people hear that autism is on a spectrum, and now in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, it is autism spectrum disorder, so there's some truth in it, um, and truth in it in the data, but when they hear spectrum, they think a linear continuum, where you're either more autistic or you're less autistic, and there's these people who are, you know, severely quote-unquote autistic who can't function in society, and then there's kind of quote-unquote higher functioning people who can and that really just flattens so much of what's happening behind the scenes uh, for the individual autistic person and how much effort they're putting into appearing quote unquote functional in order to survive. Um, and that also really um, flattens how multifaceted autism is. So someone might have really, really severe sensory issues where, you know, hearing a person chewing next to them really feels like physical pain for them and they go into meltdowns and, you know, need to like get away from the area as quickly as possible or they can't focus or think. Someone might have really kind of severe, um, quote unquote, you know, sensory issues in that regard and be someone who doesn't have, let's say, trouble making eye contact. So maybe they're, you know, very autistic in a stereotypical way on one trait, but not quote unquote, severely autistic on another. And that's true for basically every trait that you see in autism. So, you know, I'm super uncoordinated and autism being a developmental disability, it took me until my thirties to really have any kind of physical abilities where I could like go to an exercise class and figure out how to follow what people are doing in that class. Um, whereas my sister who has plenty of autism spectrum traits she can watch a music video and know the choreography right after watching it. It's actually one of her like um, special interests or one of her kind of heightened abilities as someone on the spectrum. So this is all a very uh, long detailed way of saying that every single autistic trait varies. There isn't a clear line between who's autistic, like what, where the cutoff is for what counts as autistic enough on any single particular trait. Um, we're all a complicated constellation of different traits and different struggles. And we might look more neurotypical in some areas of our life and really struggle in others. And so that's why the idea of autism being this, this clear line between the functional and the non-functional really doesn't hold up. It doesn't really speak to our actual diversity of experiences. So would it be appropriate to say some people have a more severe form of autism than, than others? And 
does this is there sort of a hierarchy that a social hierarchy that ends up being created uh, towards perhaps where you end up on the spectrum? So the autism self-advocacy community, we really moved away from talking about severity because it oversimplifies and because a lot of times when someone gets called severely autistic, what it actually means is the non-disabled person in that disabled person's life has more of a hassle, quote unquote, dealing with them. So it's this very objectifying view of, oh, if your child doesn't speak, he's more severely autistic, even if he can communicate just fine through sign language or an app on his iPad or something like that, purely because it's more of a hassle if you're a neurotypical parent of that kid. So, um, and, and, and viewing us in terms of how much difficulty we present to others is a really, you know, dehumanizing approach. So instead, what a lot of professionals and a lot of autistics have moved towards is instead talking about support needs. So that is a little bit hierarchical, um, though that's still oversimplifying it. Some people are, have higher support needs than others. So that really focuses on the autistic person's experience. So if I have high support needs, I might need help remembering to take my medication if I'm on any medication, or I might need help with meal planning or navigating overwhelming, confusing environments like, you know, going to the DMV. Whereas if I'm someone with low support needs, I might be able to kind of white knuckle my way through a lot of those aspects of life. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's easy or that I couldn't benefit from accommodations. Um, so that's really the way that it's kind of been shifting in the culture and how we talk about it. Um, thinking about what does the person with the disability need in order to be comfortable and thrive rather than um, how severe of a quote unquote problem do they present to anyone else? T tell me more about the autism rights community or autism rights uh, movement. Yeah. So for a really long time, the public discourse on autism has been led by the non-disabled parents of disabled kids. And this is certainly true for organizations like Autism Speaks, which for many, many years didn't have a single autistic person on their board and really advocated for a lot of um, treatments that autistic people ourselves are really generally really averse to. Things like ABA therapy, um, which is applied behavioral analysis therapy. It's the only therapeutic treatment uh, that is covered by insurance for autistic kids. But all it really does um, in terms of its philosophical approach and purpose in ABA therapy is to train kids to fake a more neurotypical personality, no matter how much distress it might actually cause them, you know, to make eye contact when it's painful or sit still when their body is just crying out to fidget and get some of that nervous energy out. Um, so that's the legacy that goes back decades. Um, the founder of ABA therapy, Ivar Lovas, also founded anti-gay conversion therapy um, and he had the same goals in mind with both of those therapies, take kids that stand out as other and train them to be normal. Thankfully, in recent years, um, pretty much since the late 80s, we've had the neurodiversity movement and the autism self-advocacy movement, which really say no policy should be set about us without us leading that conversation. And there have been major strides in organizing and educating the public about our perspectives and needs in that time. And that's also where we get the concepts of neurodiversity, the idea that autism isn't this illness that we need to cure, but it, that it's just a naturally occurring uh, human variance. It's just a human source of diversity that we can be accepting towards instead of viewing as pathology. Um, and then the, the kind of leading counterpoint to that, um, basically the counterpoint to Autism Speaks is the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network, which has chapters all over the United States and partners internationally that really advocate for, here's how you make a world that is more approachable and comfortable for autistic people, instead of having this approach that autistic people are the ones that need to change or mask ourselves. Nothing about us without us. This is a, a common and a uh, long time said statement within the disability rights community in, in general. When you were talking, I was also reminded of previous eras. And, I, and it, it reminded me of, of, of a struggle with the mental health rights community and an organization called NAMI, which stood for National Alliance for the Mentally Ill. And 
this group NAMI was made up of, you know, family members of people who had mental illness. And there, there was a bit of a split that, that happened in, in the last couple of decades uh, concerning organizations that were more that that were made up of people who were mentally ill who were saying no we're, we're going to make our own decisions and and it, it was and we saw this split over issues over forced medication and and these kind of things i mean it, it sounds very similar um we're talking about autism specifically here but that that also include people who had autism yeah yeah these um these struggles have kind of run in parallel and pretty much have hit the same milestones over time. So um, in the 80s, uh, for example, a lot of parents of kids with disabilities advocated for uh, what we now call person first language, for example. So they said, you know, oh, don't call my kid autistic, say they're a person with autism. And in other disability communities, it was it was the same thing, you know, say that it's person, you know, with, with whatever disability. the disability person with a disability instead of disabled person. And there was always this pushback from the people who actually had those disabilities saying, hey, we don't need to distance ourselves from our disabilities. It's not a bad word. We don't need euphemisms like specially, you know, special needs or differently abled. We can just name the reality because having a disability isn't a bad thing. You know, using a wheelchair isn't a bad thing. Being an autistic person that's that's not a bad thing and it's not something tacked on to us just like we wouldn't say person with homosexuality we just say you know gay person it's a big an integral part of their personhood so yeah um these tensions have been playing themselves out for the last several decades and there's a huge amount of overlap between just the more broad uh, disability justice community and what's happening in the autism world and and these fights that we keep having and get these really kind of intense, uh, you know, boundary lines that have been drawn, even though, of course, actually, because autism has a strong genetic component, probably a lot of these parents that we're fighting with probably are masked autistic people who are projecting some of their own shame and stigma onto their kids because they've struggled all their life with a disability and not known it, or at least with some autism spectrum traits. And then they have a kid who's more visibly disabled and they're uncomfortable with that. And so I hope we can get to a point where we realize we actually are in a shared struggle and that we need a lot of the same supports, whether we're a caregiver or a person who has the disability ourselves. Because, yeah, it's been these really deeply entrenched fights over language and frameworks. It's been going back years, lifetimes even. What are the big issues right now in the autism world, in the autism rights community? So the biggest fight for a long time was the fight about vaccines. And unfortunately, it's evergreen, and even more relevant today, um, based on the back of one now discredited study in the UK, people had this belief that the MMR vaccine caused autism. And it was because having a kid who was autistic was seen as such a terrifying fate, right, that so many parents got swept up in that fervor and denied their kids really important preventative vaccines. So that's been a really big fight in the autism world for a long time now, educating the public that no, vaccines do not cause autism. And also why is the idea of having an autistic child so terrifying that you'd rather have your kid get measles, mumps, and rubella um, than be autistic, even if that were the case, um, which of course it's not. So that's still very much a battle. Um, another big because battle, of the, because of, uh, forgive me, but because of the, okay. I really want to hone in on this because this is something we we hear because of the mm-hmm. negative. So the consequence of that, of that conspiracy theory, was that it portrayed people in a negative light and brought a stigma and reinforced a stigma. Right. Yeah. There's so many huge shockwaves of that belief that a lot of people had and still have that vaccines cause autism. It really worsened the stigma associated with autism because it treated it as this terrifying condition that your child just develops as the side effect of an unhealthy, unsafe treatment. And then, of course, it um, resulted in a lot of people not getting really crucial vaccines and really weakening our herd immunity from all of these conditions. And it's been a problem with convincing people to get vaccinated for COVID too, um, because that fear of vaccines has gotten so widespread. Um, But yeah, another huge side effect of it is just giving a lot of parents this impression that autism is this terrible thing that steals your child away from you, which 
could not be a more horrific way to look at your own kid and their disabilities and their needs. This is Letters in Politics, and we are in conversation with Dr. Devin Price. He's a social psychologist, professor, author, and person with autism, and he is the author of the book that we are in conversation about called Unmasking Autism, Discovering the New Faces of Neurodiversity. I, I interrupted you when you were about to name a few of the other big issues, and, and I do no, want to know what they are. Yeah, so I think another one of the big issues for autistic people as a community right now is the return to work following, uh, quote unquote, following the pandemic. Uh, a, a lot of us have really enjoyed and benefited from the flexibility, the slower pace, the ability to do work in privacy and in an environment where we can control our sensory diet um, and our social overload uh, that the pandemic um, has, has given us and that work from home has given us. So that's another really big force. I think a lot of the workplace issues and labor force issues that are affecting everyone right now are affecting disabled people and autistic people particularly strongly. Um, the great resignation certainly has been um, something that a lot of people, both in the autism and the ADHD communities, or people with mental illness as well, people who have struggled in the conventional workplace, one of the positive side effects of the pandemic and work from home is that a lot of people have realized that a nine to five work schedule in a physical workplace was incredibly grueling to them and that they didn't have to actually live that way all their lives. So that's a really big one that a lot of us are advocating for that companies should be retaining flex time, work from home, really flexible work options. And that really makes it far more possible for people with disabilities, a variety of disabilities, to be able to work and thrive. That's another huge one. Another huge issue affecting the community is just the invisibility of autistics who aren't white cisgender men. So um, looking back to the uprisings um, and protests in the movement for black lives in 2020, a lot of people don't realize that 50% of people shot by the police in America have a disability. Um, so a lot of black autistic people have to worry every single day about being seen as dangerous or scary and having to face state violence when all they're doing is you know walking down the street flapping their hands to self-regulate their emotions something that almost every autistic person is familiar with with needing to do so bringing more light and attention to the really heightened discrimination that um, black and brown autistics face and how erased they've been from uh, the disability justice world and just most people's understanding of what autism is and what it looks like. That's another really pressing issue in our community right now. Yeah, it makes me think of a, a good friend to this radio program, Leroy Moore, who has spent a ton his life working on this issue around race and disability and, and policing. And it's an argument he makes is that, look, a, a, a great number of those people that you see now in video so cell phone videos um, being shot by police, oftentimes they have some kind of a disability, frequently a, some kind of a mental disability or a psychological disability. Absolutely. You know, autistic people, one of the great strengths and curses of us is that we, we are not compliant. Our bodies don't comply to neurotypical norms. If a rule doesn't make sense to us or a social norm doesn't make sense to us, we often will step outside of it. Um, I point to some research in the book showing autistic people are more likely to be whistleblowers when they witness ethical issues at their companies. We're firebrands and we don't conform and sometimes we can't conform. Um, but what that means, especially if you're a black autistic or an autistic person of color, your nonconformity is seen as violent or aggression or scary, and you get really harshly punished for it. And sometimes it costs you your life. And that's even if you're doing something that in a white autistic person would just be seen as a little bit quirky, um, a little bit unusual. Um, and so that's a really huge force that I think a lot of people just don't realize how much these two issues intersect. What is happening physiologically with autism? So there's a lot going on uh, physiologically with autism. There's a lot of neurological differences that we tend to notice. Um, so one um, physiological difference in autism is, and I'll try to explain it as simply as I can, uh, we have a very different, what's called the global to local interference ratio in terms of how our neurons fire off. 
which what that means, basically, it goes back to what I was talking about before about uh, being bottom up processors instead of top down processors. So generally speaking, autistic people, our sensory systems are very easily set off. We notice lots of small details. We don't filter out information. We have very hyper excitable neurons that don't uh, distinguish between the noise and, uh, you know, don't, don't tell the difference between the forest and the trees, basically. Um, and a lot of this research is still pretty, um, pretty recent. You know, there's a lot of what makes autism what it is that we still don't fully understand in terms of neural and brain-based differences. But that is one that we really consistently see. Um, another one is that um, most people have, most non-autistic people have something called sensory adaptation, which just means... If you hear some annoying noise happening in the other room, it might annoy you for a little bit, but then it kind of trails off in it from a perceptual level level for most brains. It becomes less loud to you um, and you don't notice it as much. Whereas we do know for autistic brains, the exact opposite occurs. So an annoying background noise actually becomes kind of from our internal experience, louder and louder and more painful and more distracting longer we're exposed to it. And that isn't just literally sound. When I say noise, it can also be things like clutter or um, a flashing light in the periphery of our vision or just having to attend to the movement of other people in the room. Um, We actually get more worn down and experience more sensory pain from those things the longer we're exposed to it. So those are some of the differences. But um, a lot of times what we know about what defines autism is We do know it runs in families, it has a genetic component, and we do know how autistic people describe it, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we have every bit of it um, mapped neurologically yet. The the noise thing is interesting to me because because noise drives me up the wall, and... (laughs) I, you know, and, and I, I just think to myself, well, you're just getting, you're becoming an old crank, you know, is what I think about myself. And I've even wondered aloud, well, you know, shoot, I wonder if I'm, if I, I'm, I'm showing uh, aspects of, of autism here, because if, if I hear it down the street or outside, I'm in my apartment, suddenly that that's all I hear for a while, you know, and it, and it just drives me mad. I just want it to go away. And I've, I've wondered out loud, well, you know, do, do I have, I wonder if I have traits of, of autism here. And then people say, well, you know, you're, you're pretty good socially though, you know, and that doesn't mean anything, right? No, these aren't doctors who are telling me this, but they'll say, you know, you have pretty good social skills. I don't, I don't think you're, I don't think you have it at all. So can, so I guess that gets me to a question of, because somebody is being bothered by sound that way, does that mean they have autism? And of course, I mean, I assume all of this is a lot more complicated. And I'm not asking you to diagnose me here uh, over Zoom in a first time meeting. But um, I, I think people see traits that are associated with autism and then s- wonder whether or not they would be considered autistic or not. Yeah, it's a difficult question um, because all of these things exist on a spectrum, right? So sensory issues, they can affect you if you have anxiety or trauma. Different brains are just different. Different sensory systems are just different. And I'm sure it's part of uh, what led you to work in the field that you work in, or at least it's a strength working in like sound and video production, uh, having sensitive ears. Where I can control it. Where I can control it. Right. Yeah. And being really attuned to what you're producing and what you're recording is really an asset as much as it is as it is also maddening right um so these things do exist on spectrums and and people in the non-autistic population have it too um so it is a little bit tricky and we do also have a lot of uh disabilities that are kind of sister conditions so sensory processing disorder really commonly overlaps with autism but some people do just have sensory processing disorder they just have the sensory piece and they don't have any of the other struggles that we associate with autism or sometimes someone is the family member of an autistic person and they might have some traits but not others Um, but it's also the case that autism doesn't always look the way we stereotype it as looking. So, you know, I've, I've definitely been told before that I don't seem autistic um, because I can carry on a conversation and be charming, apparently. And really, in my case, the, the ability to socialize and connect with people, part of it comes from some of the 
gifts, if we can call it that, of autism. A lot of autistic people have really intense empathy. The stereotype is that autistic people don't have any empathy, but actually a lot of the data suggests that we're actually, many of us at least, overloaded by how much social and emotional information we're getting from other people. And so we have to just kind of shut down and blank out um, because it's so overwhelming, just kind of absorbing other people's emotions and their nonverbal signals that they're giving off. Um, so autistic people can be very empathic. They can be great listeners. They can be very social. Um, in my case, I definitely, you know, we tend to have very analytic minds. So social scripting is a thing a lot of us do. We learn the patterns of how to interact with someone in this really effortful, meticulous way. I have one person that I interviewed in the book who's a fiction writer, and he always gets told his dialogue is incredibly naturalistic and effortless. And it's because he spent in his old life, in his old career, hours planning for every meeting he had to go to at work writing hypothetical dialogue of if someone at this work meeting says this this is how i'll respond <laughs> and so that's that's a thing in autism a lot of us seem really sociable and um empathic but it's because we put so much of our analytical abilities to breaking down and studying how to relate to other people um so yeah so autism isn't necessarily what people think it is or how it looks some of us can be very good conversationalists and listeners and, and what have you i suspect autism the condition of autism goes as far back as, as humans themselves. But when do we diagnose it as autism? When do we start to notice it and talk about it and see it as something? Yeah, so there are some uh, disabilities and mental illnesses that um, as psychologists, we can kind of look back cross-culturally and throughout history and see pretty much always existed, um, where uh, there are others that seem to be a little bit more culturally bounded. Autism seems to have always existed. ADHD seems to have always existed. Schizophrenia, bipolar. Certainly, humans have always experienced depression and anxiety um, to various levels. But we really only started seeing um, autism described in the early 1900s, for the most part. And um, Stephen Silverman has this excellent book, Neurotribes, that really tracks the history of how autism was first observed by psychiatrists. And basically there were some in the United States and there were some working in parallel in Germany right before and then during Nazis taking over that country um, who were both kind of independently um, doing work to describe this disability that they noticed. Um, and it, our conceptualization of it has really changed since that time. Uh, back during that time, Psychiatrists thought autism was a childhood form of schizophrenia, actually, because you see a lot of the similar um, withdrawal and um, kind of be appearing to be in your own world in a lot of autistic kids. That's just how we kind of cope with being overwhelmed, I think, a lot of us. And that looks very similar to what schizophrenia looks like in a lot of people. Um, so that's, that's a very general history of autism, but um, it continues to to take on new depth um, in the clinical understanding, because for many decades, we were only ever described from the outside. Um, so another thing that Stephen Silverman points out is nobody even knew about autistic people having sensory issues until we started listening to autistic people like Temple Grandin, for instance, the kind of famous um, autistic scientist who was one of the first people to, to describe what sensory issues felt like for the public. Um, but I could go on and on and on again about, about the long, the long uh, fraught history of how autism has been described, but that's that's its history overall, and we're still really refining it. Well, I invite you to do so. If, if there's other things you want to, to bring up, please, please do, because we, we think this history is important. Sure, yeah. I guess another one that I would touch on is for a long time, people were trying to hit on some kind of environmental cause of autism. So there was this theory especially in the 50s into the 60s, that autism was caused by refrigerator mothers, which was this term for basically mothers who were too emotionally cold to their children. And it was probably psychiatry responding with anxiety to feminism and this fear that more women were entering the workforce and were not wanting to be defined just in terms of their parenthood. Because it was right around that time that we see a lot of psychiatrists saying, oh, all of these emotionally cold, career-driven mothers are giving their kids autism by not being nurturing enough. 
So that was one theory of where autism came from for a long time. And then, of course, we had the fear of vaccines being seen as a root cause of autism. So it's interesting how autism for a really long time has been this specter that people have projected whatever their cultural fears are onto. And now, to a limited extent, we see the same thing with technology, I think, that, that a lot of parents have these fears that their kids are spending too much time online, which maybe that's true. <laughs> maybe that's not a good thing for a variety of reasons, but sometimes it plays out in terms of saying, oh, that's why my kid's socially awkward. Um, their phone or being on TikTok too much gave them autism and things like that. Um, and we also see that today with this fear that um, this alarmism in the um, in the transphobic, in the transcritical, transphobic world, that there's too many autistic people who are trans. And so maybe maybe the, our trans identities are suspect, basically, because how can you trust someone with a disability to also declare that their identity as a queer person. That's another big realm where we see it. So, so there's this through line throughout history of whatever society is nervous about at the time, whether it's feminism, vaccines, trans identity, technology, autistic people get pulled into that cultural war and get kind of demonized for it in ways that are used to justify taking our rights away in, in many respects. Is there a correlation with the trans community and, and autism? Uh, the short answer is yes, um, but I definitely challenge people to question the interpretation of what it means. We do know that more autistic people identify as trans than in the non-autistic population. We also know that more trans people identify as gay or bisexual than in the non-autistic population. So for me, the question is always, um, it's not why are so many autistic people trans it's really why are so many non-autistic people in the closet about these identities um, is really how I would reframe it. You also write about how women have been treated differently when it comes to diagnosing autism. Absolutely, yeah. So for a long time, there's been this writing in the literature about quote-unquote female autism. And psychiatrists, if you're trying to seek out an assessment, you'll sometimes still even hear this. I've heard this from many autistic women that I interviewed for the book. Sometimes they'll get turned away for an assessment simply because uh, their psychiatrist believes that autism, that autism doesn't happen in women um, or that if it does happen in women, it's milder. And so it's not a big deal. When I've looked over the literature, I believe it's an interpretation issue again, where basically the struggles of autistic women have been taken less seriously than the, than the struggles of autistic men. Um, generally speaking, there is no evidence that actually autism is less severe in girls. It's just that as a society, we force girls to fake social niceties more, to complain less. From a really young age, we for force young girls to be less um, aggressive in their play. They need to be more like nurturing in their play. And if they do any play fighting, they get way more severely punished for it than boys do. And so what this means on a really broad scale is when a girl or a woman has autism spectrum traits, she's punished for it so much more harshly that she really has to mask it and hide it. And then we turn around and tell her, oh, your autism doesn't look so severe because you're, you've are you been forced to hide it. So you don't need those social supports and that help. And maybe you don't even need a diagnosis because you've had to learn how to mimic um, kind of normal feminine behaviors. Um, and that's a really big problem in the community to this day. And we still see a major um, proportional difference in uh, how many women get diagnosed and how much later in life they get diagnosed when they do because it's so misunderstood and overlooked in women and girls. Devin Price, I want to ask you about how autism is portrayed today. And I wanted to ask specifically, and if this is something that you're always being asked about, I, 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 I beg for your forgiveness now, but there was a TV series that was put out by Amazon called As We See It. And it was about three people who had autism, who were roommates, they all lived together, and how they navigated their world. And my understanding is all three of the actors also had autism themselves. Do, have you seen that series? Do you have thoughts on that series? Um, I unfortunately have not. 
Um, but if, if they did actually cast autistic people in the role, that's certainly better than most portrayals, you know, in terms of showing the show doing their due diligence. Um, but I haven't seen it, unfortunately. Yeah. One of the things that it made me think about, um, and also in preparing for our conversation, is some relationships that I've had with people in the past uh, that were somewhat difficult relationships, relationships that I, I didn't quite understand what was happening. And it could have been on my end. There's multiple things that could be happening here. So I don't want to say it was because this person may have had autism or, or was somewhere on the spectrum, right? Because I could have been a jerk. I mean, there's just so many different things. They could have been a jerk without being autistic, right? There's so many things that could have happened. But, but it has made me think about relationships in the past that I didn't quite comprehend what was going on, in which I felt like some things may not have been reciprocated and some things that I interpreted at the time as some destructive behavior on their part. Again, it could be many things, so I'm not asking you to comment about any particular thing, but, it did, but I have wondered if I've had relationships with people in the past I don't have relationships with now. I have wondered, I wonder if they are on somewhere on the spectrum of, of autism. And, and I almost regret not thinking about that now when I look in the past of that. And I'm not asking you to comment about any of the relationships I would have, but, but I would, rem I wonder if this is sort of a, a common dynamic of, of interactions with people without realizing what was happening. Yeah. So, so one thing that I would point out with regard to that is how much of mainstream neurotypical social rules lies in the things that are left unsaid and how difficult of a social minefield that is for autistic people. We tend to interpret people's statements hyper literally. Um, if somebody asks me how my day is, my first inclination is to actually be honest when usually that's not why someone's asking that question. Or if somebody in my life asks me my opinion about what they're doing, I'll usually tell them pretty bluntly what I actually think. And sometimes that's gone really disastrously. And I've lost friendships over being too bluntly honest and not realizing that it read as cruel or judgmental to the other person. Um, we also just tend to miss a lot of things that are just said between the lines. And that means that sometimes we unwittingly hurt and disappoint people who are trying to drop signals to us that they want us to show up to some event, that they want a certain gift for their birthday, that they want some kind of emotional response that we're not picking up on. And so for a lot of autistic people, we've stepped on these social landmines over and over again all our lives not even knowing what we're doing wrong because we're just trying to interpret the data that is kind of bombarding us and that we see. And it leads a lot of us to have really, really heightened um, social inhibition. We really second guess everything that we say and do after a certain point, because we've just said the wrong thing so many times. Um, we may have really intense social anxiety. We may have trouble trusting and opening up to other people or just wear a really superficial mask again, hence the title of the book, where we just try to seem as inoffensive as possible because we have really screwed up in the eyes of the neurotypical people around us before. Um, so I have a lot of stories of that in the book from my own life and from the life of people that I've profiled. And it's a complicated thing because if I've hurt someone's feelings, me having a disability doesn't necessarily excuse that, right? If I've said something that's hurtful, I still hurt someone's feelings. And having the op opportunity to take accountability for that is a real gift. Like when a friend of mine tells me, oh, it really hurt my feelings when you made that joke or when you made that really blunt observation, that is so meaningful to me as an autistic person because it gives me a chance to learn what was happening behind the scenes and adjust. Um, but at the same time, I would really encourage people, especially people who aren't autistic, to try and communicate more directly and to let people know when they've missed a cue and when they've hurt your feelings, because whether they're autistic or not, you know, who knows what's going on with some of those people in your life. Maybe some of them were autistic and maybe some of them were jerks and maybe some of them were both, right? Um, opening up really clear, direct lines of communication makes it possible for all of us to resolve our conflicts and step up and be better friends and loved ones to each other. And that's true regardless of whether or not someone has a disability. Um, so that's something I've worked on a lot in my own life and relationships since finding out I was autistic. 
And those have been the relationships in my life that have really deepened and healed and thrived are the ones with people who can say, oh, hey, I asked you this question, not because I wanted a literal answer to it, but because I wanted to bring your attention to this thing. Or even better, when someone stops playing those kinds of games and is just really straightforward, like, hey, I'm having a party tonight. It would mean a lot to me if you would come. Or, hey, I just, you know, made this game or made this song. It would really mean a lot to me if you would listen to it and check it out. You know, not instead of dropping hints, whatever the situation is. Um, Because so much of interpersonal activity are hints and not obvious signals that we send to each other. Right. Yeah. And I think it would make a more comfortable world for all of us, disabled and non-disabled alike, if we just met what we said and said what we meant more often. And um, that makes it possible to build more accessible relationships with the autistic with the autistic people you do encounter. And just having a little bit of patience with bluntness and obliviousness or what seems like obliviousness. Though, again, if somebody repeatedly crosses the line and they don't seem to care when you've given them the opportunity to make good on it or you've told them that they hurt your feelings then, you know, a disability isn't an excuse for abusive or cruel behavior. But being really clear about that stuff can really help make a huge difference. Obviously, you're, you're very upfront about being autistic. Um, still hard to do, though, for a lot of people, I imagine. Absolutely. But, but it sounds, uh, uh, for, forgive me, because it, uh, my bad, because it also seems like being able to be upfront about it can smooth a lot of these interactions over? It really can. And um, there's really some encouraging experimental evidence even that um, shows that if a non-autistic person meets an autistic person and they don't know they're autistic and they have an interaction with them, they'll often walk away from that interaction not liking the autistic person very much and feeling kind of off and just a little weird. Whereas if they meet that same autistic person and they are told beforehand oh, this person's autistic, they tend to report liking the person more, having kind of more patience with them, and being more interested in learning more about autism moving forward, which is also a really encouraging finding. Um, And this is all stuff that I cite in the book. Um, And this is also true to just a lot of people's lived experiences, if you talk to them. Um, When it's safe to kind of put that foot forward and tell people when you meet them, or as you get to know them at least, that you have a disability, In my experience and in a lot of other people's experience, you get more curiosity and patience and people self-educate sometimes. In some of my most meaningful relationships now, the person really looked into how do I communicate better with an autistic person? What do I need to be patient about? What do I need to be mindful of? It can make a world of difference. That said, it's also really risky. I would, especially in the workplace, encourage people to be really intentional about whether or not you can trust your coworker, your managers, your employer to not discriminate against you. Because even though it's illegal in theory to discriminate against autistic people under the Americans with Disabilities Act, in practice, sometimes once you tell people you have a disability, they start looking at you differently and treating you in a really infantilizing or judgmental way. So, you know, I'm all for unmasking. I'm all for us being our authentic selves and advocating for ourselves. But I also know sometimes it's really risky and dangerous, unfortunately. The stigma is still there. The stigma is massive, yeah. Dr. Devin Price has been our guest. Again, Dr. Price is a social psychologist, professor, a person with autism, and author of the book that he has joined us to talk about called Unmasking Autism, Discovering the New Faces of neurodiversity. Devin Price, I've enjoyed our conversation very much, and I thank you dearly for taking this time to join us today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me.